Well, hello, and welcome to this first video on the teaching of the Book of Revelation. Now, my name is uh, Kathy, and I've been studying the Book of Revelation for over a year and a half, and I've been doing teachings on it for about six months. But I felt led to put those teachings on video and share them with a broader audience. So I welcome anyone here who has come in here <clears throat> to hear these teachings. And before we get started, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and guide us, open our minds, open our hearts, and open our understanding to your word, that we might be able to grow closer to you through it. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, we're going to be teaching on Revelation. And before we really get into it, there are some things that we need to understand <clears throat> about the book itself in order to interpret and understand what's going on within it. First of all, it's not written like a novel. It does not have a linear timeline like the Gospels do. If anything, it resembles the epistles of the New Testament in that it is written as a letter. It starts out with an introduction, then it has a greeting, then it goes into the main body of the letter. It concludes with a blessing and then a private note to those that it is intended for. And that's where the similarity to the epistles ends. Because when you get into the book of Revelation, you'll find that there is much symbolism. Now, when our creator uses symbolism to communicate with us, he really doesn't do it to confuse us or to distract us or to trip us up in any way. When he uses symbolism, a uh, symbol has pretty much the same meaning everywhere it's used. Now that meaning can branch off into different segments, but it still has the same basic meaning. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take the word star. Now, a star is used throughout the Bible to mean just that, a star in the sky. But it's also used symbolically. And when it is used symbolically, it refers to an angel. But then it branches off. It refers to the angels, the holy angels, who are loyal to our Creator, and it can refer to the unholy angels, those who rebelled against God and fell. So we can see that we need, when we see symbolism, even though it might have the same basic meaning, we have to be able to discern what that meaning is referring to which branch, as it goes out, is it referring to? The other thing that the book of Revelation is different is that it has the name Revelation. So what does that mean? Why is it called Revelation? Now, that comes from the Greek word apokalesis. And apokalesis means an uncovering or an unveiling or a revealing. But where we get confused and what we do wrong is we think about the other word that comes from that Greek word, and that is apocalypse. And we intertwine revelation and apocalypse, and that's where we go wrong. If you look up the word apocalypse in the dictionary, it means the end of the world or the destruction of the world. But that's not 
what revelation means. Revelation means, as I said, an uncovering, an unveiling, a revealing. So what is it a revealing of? Well, we find out right away. If you read chapter 1 and the first five words, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revealing of Jesus Christ. The unveiling or the uncovering of Jesus Christ and what he did. The next thing we need to look at is Jesus himself. And we see in Revelation, <clears throat> he refers to himself as the Alpha and Omega. He does that four times in Scripture, and they're all in the book of Revelation. Twice before he really gets into the body of the letter, and then twice after he says, it is done. And then he says, I am the Alpha and Omega. And in conjunction with Alpha and Omega, he always says the phrases, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end the first and the last. And he always uses those along with Alpha and Omega. So let's look at those two words. They're both Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek and translated into other languages. So let's look at this. Alpha. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, like A, in the English language. And when you use the word Alpha in Scripture, it usually is referring to the Lord as the originator. So what did he originate? Well, you can say that the Word of God was with God in the beginning when everything was created and nothing was made without him. And that's true. Jesus was there with the Father in the beginning of creation. However, is that what he's talking about here is the question. And it isn't. Here, he's talking about something different. He's talking about himself as the originator with what is going on in the battle, the spiritual warfare between good and evil. Or else he would have used the words Alpha and Omega and Omega somewhere else. When he was walking the earth, he would have said, I am the Alpha and Omega. But he didn't. He waited till after he was back with his father and he uses the words Alpha and Omega. So he is the Alpha, the originator of this final battle between good and evil. When he became the sacrificial lamb and was crucified, he started the battle because he defeated Satan. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And he restored everything to its original intention. All of creation. However, in the spirit world, he did that. In our natural world, we're still playing this out. We're still going through the steps to get to what he accomplished. So let's look at Omega. Omega was the last letter of the Greek alphabet, like our Z. <clears throat> and when you use the term Omega in Scripture, it refers to God's endlessness or eternity. Now, by Jesus being the Omega, what he did will last for an eternity. It will be endless. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending of this spiritual battle, the first, the first to resurrect, and the last. He will last forever. The kingdom and the sacrifice and what he accomplished by coming to earth and living a life as a human being among us. So now let's look at the introduction and that's what we're going to talk about today. 
the introduction to Revelation, and it's only the first three verses. And we're going to look at the wording that's used in it and compare it to other places in the Bible. Because when you study the Bible, you can't study it as a book or a chapter or a verse completely. You have to see it as a big picture. It takes in so much more than just that. And you can't just study the New Testament or the Old Testament. You have to study both. So oftentimes, when we study Revelation, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. And we're going to find places where the prophets were told similar things to what John was shown. And they were shown similar things about the end times, just as John was shown. And it all comes together. So let's start with chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, that's us, the believer, we're his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. We're going to look at that word shortly. And you'll find that out a lot in Revelation where you zero in on one word. One word can have a lot of meaning. And this word shortly means speed in Greek. It's used as hastily or immediately. So these <clears throat> things that we are being shown as the believers, as the servants of Christ, they must come hastily or immediately. Now we're going to skip over to verse 3. And it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written where, where therein, for the time is at hand. Time is referring to a season. And hand means near. So we actually, we could have read this verse saying, and keep those things which are written therein, for the season is near. Now there have been many seasons throughout the Bible. We have the season of creation. We have the season of the patriarchs. We have the season of the Israelites in Egypt in captivity, and then the season after they leave captivity where they're taken to the promised land and they live with judges and with kings. Then we have the season of Christ himself coming to earth. Then we have the season we're living in. And after us, there'll be two more seasons. But the season we're living in is what we're focused on and what most of the book of Revelation focuses on. And that season began for us at Pentecost. Now you can call this season the church age, the age of grace, or you can call it the season of tribulation. Now I know that many people who teach the end time prophecies refer to the years of tribulation as the last seven years and then the great tribulation as the last three and a half of those seven years. And I don't dispute the significance of those years. They are very significant, especially the last three and a half. But as we go into Revelation, we'll find out that the tribulation does not center in just those last seven years. It actually expands through the entire church age, through the entire age of grace. And we know that because of what John is being told here. And we'll see that we can understand that because of what Daniel is told. So here John is told that it's going to be shortly, it's going to be speedily, hastily, and that the season or the time is near. So let's look into the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22. And we'll see again this phrase, the time is at hand, is used. 
So John has been sh being shown around by an angel. And the angel says to him, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for this at hand. He reminds him, the time, the season is near. And he tells them not to seal the words of this prophecy up. Now what does that mean? Well, if you think of a letter back in the days of the monarchs, the kings, when a king wrote a letter and he wanted it sent to somebody, he would take wax and put it on the letter and put his ring into it, his insignia. And when it dried, that letter was sealed. And when the person who was to receive it got that letter, they would know that if that seal was intact, that nobody else knew the information that was in it. But if that seal was broken, then they knew that if that information in there was, say, classified as we call it today, that somebody else knew about it and that that might be a problem. And it's similar here. John is told, do not seal this, do not hide it. It's for not just some eyes, certain eyes, but for everyone's eyes. It's not to be sealed. But if we go back to Daniel, and in the book of Daniel, this is the last chapter, just as we just read in the last chapter of Revelation. So it's chapter 12, it's verses 8 and 9. And <clears throat> now this is Daniel speaking, and he says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Now these things he's referring to are the visions and the prophecies that he was given. And he was given visions and prophecies for the end time. And many of them were pretty similar or the same as what John was given. Because the prophecies of the Old and New Testament don't always match up 100% because we're talking about human beings who are seeing and writing down what they see. And what they see to them might be a little different. So there are little things, and we'll see that as we go through, that are a little different, but they're still the same things. So Daniel then is asking, what do these things mean? And this is what he is told. Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end, till the time of the end, for the, till the season of the end. So Daniel is given all this, and he's told, seal it. This is not for everyone's eyes. This is not for everyone to see. And what that means is, is that the Holy Spirit is not going to show the people of his day what this was about and what the meaning was. But the Holy Spirit is going to show the people of John's day what this is all about. And this is something else, the timeline, I find kind of interesting because Daniel was alive and wrote these words of his book around 600 B.C. John wrote Revelation around 96 A.D. So you're talking about 700 years. So 700 years before John, Daniel is told, seal it up. It's not for now. This is not the time of the end. John is told 700 years later, 2,000 years ago almost, 1,900 and some odd years ago, the time is the end now. Unseal it. Don't seal it. This is for everyone. And that's significant. And that's why we can know that we are in this season, this final season in the battle of good and evil otherwise known as the tribulation. And now we are also told by Jesus, when he was walking the earth, when he talked about this, he said that it was going to be like a woman in labor. Now, 
anybody that's ever experienced childbirth, whether you're the mother or the father, you know that labor starts out kind of easy, even not even sure if it's there. And I've had four children, so I know that when it begins, you're kind of questioning, oh, is that it? Or is this just something else? And then as time goes on, it gets a little more intense. And you realize, yes, this is. This is labor. This baby is coming. And then you get to where the baby is going to be delivered. And it's very intense. And it's very difficult. And that's how Jesus said this would be. So it started out at Pentecost for us. And as time has gone on, it has gotten more intense. And it will culminate in the great tribulation when it's going to be very intense. Evil is going to be very intense. And we don't know when exactly that's going to be. But we do know, because of what we have been given from our Father, that we are getting close. We can see with the things that are taking place in the world around us that things are falling into place. And how they are all going to play out is anyone's guess because prophecy most of the time does not play out the way we think it's going to. And we'll get into that also as we go through Revelation. Because it's in our nature to try to understand and figure it out. And unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, we're not going to be able to do that. And to be quite honest, there are many things He is not going to reveal to us. He gives us the broader um, picture of what's coming, but the details of how it comes together and who is who, those things are pretty much hidden from us. And we try to figure them out with our minds, but our minds cannot figure out God. So we're at a loss when it comes to the details. But we can figure out the broader sense of things. And we can come to an understanding of kind of where we are. And we'll be discussing all that as we go through this book of Revelation. Now I'm going to try to do these videos once a week, depending on my schedule. <clears throat> and next time we'll be getting into more of the meat of the body. We're going to skip over the greeting, which concerns the seven churches for now. And we're going to go to the seals because this is where Jesus starts things. And we'll talk about that then. But until then, I have something for you. Anybody that's interested, I have a book that's free. I will send it to you for free. And it is the 12 books of the Acts of the Love of God, the Divine Decrees. This is a prayer book of 12 prayers that comes from the ministry I belong to. And inside, there are instructions on how to use the prayers. Now, the prayers are for many different things. For you, for your family, for politics, for the environment, for um, religious leaders, those who are called of God. And there's prayers in here for many other things. All you have to do is send me an email to prayer for the asking at yahoo.com just tell me you want the prayer book give me your name and address and I'll get it out to you as soon as I can so until next week God bless you may God be with you and may you be safe thank you